Welcome back. I hope appropriate matters were attended to and that you are all comfortable for whatever reason. I failed to get into the changing economic element of the journalism ecosystem in the previous session, so I shall open now with that because it constitutes key variables driving journalism since the year 2000. The business model of journalism has long been built around two major factors. Remember the general system slide in the previous session? Those key or meta elements for the news institutions leading up to the year 2000 were audience size, the readers and subscribers, and advertisers. The advertisers didn't care too much about news content so long as it didn't embarrass or cast shame on the company or product being advertised. For advertisers, it's always been about the size and location of the audience and, to a lesser degree, the perceived economic character of the audience and the audience's geography. You're probably not going to advertise snow tires in Miami in January, but you are going to sell suntan lotion. So the local factor was dominant for both the readers who wanted to know what was going on in their locale and for advertisers who had products and services for people in a defined geography. The same was true for broadcasting advertisers. Local audience was the ticket, usually defined by the station's wattage and the market size, along with estimated demand for goods, services, entertainment. And the audiences of subscribers, readers, and viewers? They needed to know about school lunches, high school football scores, funerals, city and county finances, and election results. So, in the days of localized media, there was a symbiotic relationship between readership and advertisers. One needed, wanted the other. And the news media, both print and broadcasting, prospered. Oh yes, it was a fat city for those earning newspapers in cities of significant size. Broadcasting? Better yet. I recall attending a national meeting in Phoenix around the year 2000. One of the speakers reported that a high administrator of the CBS-owned and operated station in Los Angeles was fired because the station's profits had recently fallen from one year compared to the previous year. Fallen, you say? How much? The previous year in question had a gross profit around 65%. Then, oh, the tragedy. Profits fell from 65% to between 62 and 63% the next year. But from the 1970s and 1980s onward, major legal changes, not just technological, started to have a corrosive effect on American journalism and the media institutions. Yes, the First Amendment is arguably the cornerstone of American democracy. But in fact, there has been a degree of media regulation for a long time, ranging from favorable postage rates during the Revolutionary period to the FCC. It was created in the 1930s to bring some degree of order to broadcast frequencies and licensing. That was followed in the very earliest days of television by other regulations, all designed to protect local media markets and institutions even the essentially monopolistic ones. But note the language used in the 1975 so-called ownership prohibition. It discourages, discourages ownership of both a newspaper and TV station by one company. Wow, that'll show them. Shake that regulatory finger with vigor. Then, in January 1981, along comes the Reagan administration. Reagan appointed Mark Fowler, a communications attorney who had served on Ronald Reagan's presidential campaign staff in 1976 and 1980, to head the FCC. Sound familiar? That agency began overturning existing rules and experienced, quote, an overall reduction in FCC oversight of station and network operations. Remember when you would never hear such troublesome and offensive words as virgin on television? Somewhat quickly, the so-called deregulation meant that aggressive and well-financed organizations could expand corporate ownership of television stations from 5 to 12. And in 1987, the Fairness Doctrine, which 
required the holders of broadcast licenses to both present controversial issues of public importance and to do so in a manner that was, quote, honest, equitable, and balanced. That fairness doctrine was removed by the FCC. That rule was eliminated by a 4-0 to zero vote of the FCC board and stricken from the Federal Register. Congress fought against the rule and passed a bill adopting the doctrine as statute. Reagan himself vetoed the law. The broadcasting sector of the infosphere was changing in a major, and we can now understand a more significant way, perhaps, than print. Thus began a bipartisan, bipartisan disposition in Congress for passing federal deregulation legislation, something that continued into the 1990s. So this was the last half of the 1980s, with multiple communication lengths pouring forth digital bytes by digital bytes. The infosphere was changing across the globe. The decade moved into the 1990s. George H.W. Bush was out. Bill Clinton was in. And with Clinton comes the 1996 Telecommunications Act. Some will argue even today that this packet of laws is among the most significant in the history of communications driving even more deregulation than what happened in the Reagan years. That is, increasing the potential for capitalist corporate acquisition. The consolidation of media ownership was rampant. As you can see, ownership dropped. Consolidation led to centralized radio with pre-recorded programming. Forget the disc jockey creating a themed playlist leading into drive time. Just cue up the tape from the home office. The tide of consolidation continues through the 90s and into the second decade of the 2000s. The graphic is difficult to read here, but basically we have ended up with four cable companies in the United States. Comcast Xfinity, Time Warner Cable, Charter, and Cox. If you think that graphic is a lot to take in, try this one. By 1990, and for the rest of the decade, digital things accelerated. The consumer and corporate technologies, the notion of startup and venture capital and capitalists, previously unimagined hardware and software, local, national, and international infrastructure, the nation, and the world, was entering into the early, early nanoseconds of the digital age. Even though journalists were often aware that change was afoot, and a portion of us tried to grab onto the tail of multiple dynamic tigers, media institutions were flush with cash, especially those dominating or monopolizing their markets. And those institutional bosses loved the financial profits and high salaries flowing from generally traditional technologies and processes. But in the background was emerging what came to be called the long tail of media. This data visualization was and is familiar to statisticians and physicists. It is often termed a power law or a Pareto distribution. To generalize, the curve typically indicates that at the head end, or the left side of the curve, approximately 20% of something accounts for 80% of the total. This distribution shows up across many disciplines astronomy to criminology to mathematics and finance, but the concept had not, to my knowledge, been applied to the media environment. Then, in January 2004, Chris Anderson, the editor of Wired magazine, wrote an article titled The Long Tail. Anderson theorized that the multitude of digital media channels, both content providers and distribution via the internet, was triggering unprecedented access to niche market content and audiences. Geography didn't matter much anymore, unless, unless someone wanted to build a website focusing on a neighborhood or a city or a state or a region. Unlike newspapers, radio, or television, there were essentially no barriers to entry. As the year 2000 approached, the World Wide Web was literally free at hand freely at hand. Personal computers, microphones, and digital cameras were relatively cheap. For $2,000 or less, one had the power to literally 
have global reach of a television production station, something available only to major networks just 15 or 20 years earlier. It was argued that the long tail of content offerings could attract large enough audiences to generate profits, sometimes more than ample profits. Indeed, the long tail was a reality. Unfortunately, many of us anticipated that the technologies would be used to challenge autocratic limitations on free speech and market dominance by the oligarchs of corporate media. We were right to a degree, but sadly too optimistic in our expectations of human kindness, fact-based logic, and applications of the golden rule. I don't need to tell you today how far off kilter and perhaps subversive has become the long tail. It has allowed evildoers to undermine honorable efforts of journalists and heretofore respected institutions. Yes, we make mistakes with regularity, but, not, but one of the unique things is that often those mistakes are recognized and corrections written and published, especially in the print media. Not often enough or with display equal to the transgressions, you say? Yes, I agree, but honorable journalists, those in traditional institutions, do work to avoid lies and unintentional errors. So-called journalists tied to some niche online publications aimed at specific interest groups? I think not so much. And a little later, I will show how I think we might help readers better understand the data in sources for our stories. Here's a quick summary of journalism economics leading up to the year 2000. Entry costs are high for print and broadcast, not necessarily for the editorial news elements, but all the other variables. There are staff costs, yes, but paper and presses and distribution are high walls for entry into traditional journalism. Simply couldn't break in easily. This is equal for the broadcast studios and transmission costs, Therefore, the per-unit costs are high for both print and broadcast media. Next, the news produced by journalists up until 2000 was based on what reporters and editors thought was important and newsworthy. They were the gatekeepers. We had only the sketchiest notion of what readers valued on any given day. One eminent scholar of media economics, Robert Picard, wrote, The value of journalism is also obscured because news is typically offered in bundles with multiple other news stories and information, thus further obscuring the value of individual journalistic pieces. This bundling problem is why individual readers on the average do not read 75% of the articles in a newspaper. They just don't find them valuable. So the year 2000 marks the unprecedented big flip, big flip to the digital data age. What had been relatively small platforms where journalism was a secondary or even tertiary function became a rising tide of user connectivity. Maybe they were looking for news, but as we can see 20 years later, Americans were more often looking for sources or people who would confirm their political, economic, and cultural biases. Here's some data from last month. It came at the end of the week when it was reported that Trump had tested positive for COVID-19. For some time now, and by the millions, people have been turning to social media platforms. The story of the 2020 election on social media is really one of domestic um, partisan activity. We've seen large hyperpartisan news outlets um, just getting enormous numbers on social media, and they're doing it um, in an environment where it's a pretty loose, laissez-faire attitude toward truth, and in which this goal is just to engage people, to keep them clicking and scrolling. Kevin Roos writes a column on technology for the New York Times. So you have these just enormous numbers for these hyper-partisan news sources that are basically disconnected from the larger mainstream media. But I think what a lot of them have in common is that they're very skilled at provoking outrage. There's a saying that what's enraging is engaging. And you're telling me that, that they have more people coming to them 
then collectively come to ABC News, NBC News, CBS News, New York Times, Washington Post. Spell that out for me. Where are they going? So there's a right-wing commentator named Ben Shapiro. So again, the media's a take here is that if Trump had just said the right things, if Trump had been super strict in what he said, then he wouldn't have gotten COVID. He's very popular among conservatives. And in the last 30 days on his Facebook page, he has gotten 51 Point four million interactions. That's more than five times as many as the New York Times, and it's more than CBS, CNN, um, NBC, ABC combined. Remember this mystery chart quiz during the intermission? Of course you do. That's why you stayed around for the second half. The blue line on this chart illustrates the rapid, dramatic, kneecapping print revenue decline for American newspapers from roughly 2000 until 2014 or 2015. And it hasn't gotten any better. Sadly so, I think, for all of us. The red line reflects the revenues, including online subscriptions and advertising. There's a lot of data to unpack here. Let's begin with the blue line, starting in 1950. The curve is obviously on a continuous growth trend for most of the 50 years. It's headed upward for five decades until it falls off the cliff in 2000. Note that it took one decade to fall back to the gross revenue starting level of 1950. Next, the downturn began before Google started coming on strong, and Facebook was a relatively late starter, so we can't blame everything on those two. But I think we can say that Americans were starting to shift to what was perceived as free news. In fact, it was because of two factors. One, newspaper management thought to build a digital subscriber base, it was necessary to make the online content available for free. This was to tempt readers and to teach them about the digital sites and tools. Second, newspaper management started to see the fall off of subscriptions. And they had to reduce costs. They couldn't reduce the costs of paper, ink, and press time. They could only reduce the distribution geography to a degree because to do so meant reducing subscribers, but they could make cuts in the newsroom. Sadly, one of the first departments to go was the news librarian researchers. Editors figured, shoot, our reporters can do their own research on the Google. We don't need salaried employees to mark up stories for the archives. And we don't need news researchers to mine the digital resources necessary for good reporting. Also, efficiency and quality suffered because copy editors were often the second newsroom crew to be trimmed. Aha, you say, wasn't Craigslist at fault? I don't believe it was. Here's a different time frame, roughly 2000 to 2010. Note that we have two dimensions of revenue. On the left y-axis is Craigslist in millions of dollars. On the right axis, is newspaper revenue in billions of dollars. But the difference is much more than just the dollar value. Understand that the newspaper classified advertising was a tripod structure, the old power law distribution again, because approximately 80% of the revenue came from just three categories, real estate ads, automotive ads, and job postings. Garage sales and pets needing a home didn't pay the bills. Craigslist initially didn't cut deeply into those print institutions, but it and evolving auto, real estate, and job websites, they did have huge advantages, and an individual could search with precision for any kind of digital content. Search by keywords, or geography, or price, or salary range. Ink on paper classifieds were flat-footed and in a stupor compared to the dynamic digital offerings. And it wasn't just the erosion of readers and viewers. There were major changes in the nation's economic and financial structures in this period. Let's take a few seconds to scan this chart. We have major companies like Blockbuster, companies like Radio Shack, major, major companies like Sears and Roebuck. Each of these companies had been serious, regular, and major newspaper advertisers. And it wasn't just in the retail sector. Again, another 
complex chart. I realize this is hard to read because of all the details. But there were at least 37 banks of significance across the United States in 1990. 20 years later, because of mergers and consolidations, that number was down to four. Yes, they were still doing some advertising of their local branches, but enough to reflect a degree of competitiveness? Well, you decide. So what was happening to this thing called journalism? Again, we look to the ownership changes, major consolidation, and all the media forms devoted to journalism and producing news, especially newspapers. Gee, what a surprise. All seven of seven major newspaper ownership chains are primarily concerned with generating returns to shareholders. And we can work down the list of characteristics to see, repeatedly, the stated primary objectives of non-local ownership. What happens when local newspapers are replaced by corporate ownership? Toward the end of the first decade of the 21st century, there were approximately 71,000 people in American newspaper newsrooms. A decade later, that number is down by nearly one half. The other media forms held fairly steady, and there was personnel growth in a number of digital news sites, small but growth. And remember, 80% of the news was originally produced by newspapers. Yes, we were starting to see digital operations like ProPublica and the Texas Tribune showing. So the investment corporations arrive like miners to the California Sierra in 1849. They come with the gleam of riches in their eyes. Did they come hoping to inform citizens? Are they driven to act as a watchdog of governments? Driven to spin tales of interesting people, things and places you didn't know about? All those factors appear only in the footnotes of the corporate P&L reports. That said, we are uncommonly fortunate here in northern New Mexico to have local family corporations owning the Santa Fe New Mexican, the Albuquerque Journal and Journal North, the Rio Grande Sun, and the Santa Fe Reporter. But they are something of an exception. The takeovers of news media by major national corporations and their profit motives led to a new phase in media studies, news deserts. There are 3,141 counties or county equivalents in the United States. Each will have some elected governing body. Each will fall under the jurisdiction of a court system. Each will probably have some sort of educational system. Each will have an office to collect and disperse tax revenues. But as of 2018, 225 of those counties do not have a local newspaper or engaged local broadcast news. Half of those counties, 1,528, have only one newspaper, and it's usually a weekly. And that data was published two years ago. Since 2004, the United States has lost 2,100 of its newspapers. 70 dailies and more than 2,000 weeklies or non-dailies. I'm confident those numbers of underserved counties has only increased because 50 local newspapers have shut down since the COVID era began late last winter. Locally, we saw the newspaper in Los Alamos, which called it quits the end of August. The newspaper in a city-county combination with 20,000 people and perhaps the highest rate of household income and education in the nation. What then is the impact of that national loss of the news media? First, without competing media, citizens lose the synergy of multiple methods and interpretations of events and phenomena. Yes, the Santa Fe Reporter and the New Mexican will both cover Indian market but likely from different angles. Doing so helps to illustrate the variety and complexity of an event. Perhaps more concerning is that lack of news competition leads to government inefficiency. The watchdog cannot bark if he's not awakened in the yard. In the aggregate, the lack of journalism leads to higher costs for taxpayers. Worrisome, too, is that when there is no news reported, citizens have no sense of civic action. 
No desire or need to participate. Who knows when the pet parade is scheduled? Who knows what issues are coming up for the school board? It's also interesting, or perhaps depressing, that we are starting to see that the lack of newspapers hinders a city's economic development. Hindering economic development? How so? In the early 1970s, when I was in graduate school at the University of Kansas, I was a stringer for the Wichita Eagle Beacon. I recall that then there were roughly 100 plus people in the newsroom, and it was a well-regarded regional publication. A couple of years ago, 35 years later, I was at a conference in Miami organized by the Knight Foundation. It brought together journalists and also leaders of foundations, especially local community foundations like the one we have in Santa Fe, to discuss America's media. A woman from a Wichita Community Foundation reported two things. First, the newsroom of the Eagle Beacon was down to 11 or 12 people, from 100 to 11 or 12. Second, Wichita has some big employers in the aircraft and petroleum industries, along with agriculture. She said that it was starting to become apparent to the executives in these entities that they are having a hard time recruiting employees to come to Wichita. Why? Applicants recognize that without a viable newspaper, Wichita's civic glue was missing. The government would suffer, as would schools and the city's cultural opportunities. So what's going on, or has gone on? What we have seen so far might be considered normal economic activity in the United States. The consolidations, the mergers, the corporate takeovers. But we are all too well aware that 2020 has been far from a normal year in the Americas, indeed around the world. COVID-19 has impacted every aspect of individual and socioeconomic life. Journalism is no exception. The Pointer Institute, based in St. Petersburg, Florida, is among the oldest and most active foundations supporting journalism. This past spring, its staff and researchers at the Toe Center for Digital Journalism at Columbia University began tracking journalism properties and publications, broadly defined, to gauge the impact of COVID-19 on newsrooms around the country. We can see some of the results here as of early October. If anyone is interested, we can pull up the latest data in the Q&A session. Maps like this, of course, are limited to a somewhat superficial context of general geographic data. That said, we intuitively have some knowledge of the population of the states and regions, so some patterns show up, some in surprising ways. For example, the Minneapolis area and both sides of the Florida coast. As academics like to write when concluding their articles, more research is called for. Why are these particular concentrations of COVID difficulty appearing? But what we note going on in the Minneapolis area might be driving institutional responses like this one. Press, one of our best regional papers, could be had for 99 cents. Three months, 99 cents, 33 cents a month. Such a deal, yes? But that's just for the digital edition. The paper is betting that if it can attract a reader long enough, he or she might be converted to a regular digital and or ink on paper subscription. Is this a good strategy for the paper? Maybe. This pricing research and debate has been going on for 20 years. Only tests like this can generate appropriate data. But one thing is certain, the cost per unit of a digital paper is close to zero once someone spends a day or half a day tweaking the software to connect this new subscription to someone's 99 cent digital account. There will be, or should be, the cost of someone to analyze the data, but at the very least, the paper is harvesting some individual's demographic and perhaps purchasing data that can be leveraged for advertisers or other publication deals. So what can be done to financially support professional journalism? Theories and experimental strategies abound. First, I think we need a resurrection of Teddy Roosevelt as president to undertake some trust-busting. 
The U.S. would benefit from some leadership that understands the detrimental side of economic concentration, especially as it applies to free and competitive news media. Where is a president and Congress who can see and appreciate that the government cannot reliably audit itself? Democracy, its citizens, need the fourth estate to conduct those financial audits and oversee the mechanics of administration. Next, it turns out that the FCC still has the ability to measure the degree of localism required when approving mergers of broadcast systems. Today, that is more, made more difficult because the corporations up for a potential merger are fully integrated print, broadcast, delivery, and even social media systems. But there are some advocates for the position that any merger of newspaper entities should also be measured by the degrees of localism tied to corporate consolidations. Next, we should basically return to the pre-Reagan days before rampant deregulation. I also think we can stipulate by now that all journalism organizations require a revenue stream. Just what, when, and how to make that happen is being debated around the world. Some observers argue we should adopt the BBC model used in Great Britain, that is, every household pays an annual tax to support government-run radio and television stations. I think not. Government control over budgets is a much too slippery slope for me. Now, you can say, well, look at National Public Radio. That works. Typically, NPR member stations receive funds through on-air pledge drives, corporate underwriting, state and local governments, educational institutions. The federally funded Corporation for Public Broadcasting amounts to approximately 2% of NPR's overall revenue. Yet there are some noble and well-intended efforts afoot for state funding. Fortunately, there are other funding strategies being talked about in various stages of implementation. Can, or should, local media companies shift from for-profit to non-profit entities? Some are trying to go down that road. Doing so doesn't mean a non-profit can't generate revenues, but there are restrictions on what they can do with income beyond the costs of running the organization. For example, nonprofit newspapers relinquish the ability to endorse candidates. Such is construed by the IRS as a foray into direct political action and would make the organization taxable. But they also have a chance to raise tax deductible donations from individuals and foundations. We have seen some notable success stories, as with the cases of the Texas Tribune, San Diego, and the Minneapolis Post. Increasingly, too, we hear about foundations, large and small, making grants to keep local journalism alive. The COVID pandemic has been the catalyst for some efforts to prop up local journalism, as this table shows. We can see some financial contributions from some major players, but note that while these efforts are much appreciated, the biggest checks top out with five zeros, $100,000. That's about what it would cost a newspaper the size of the Albuquerque Journal to support one reporter with five years' experience for one year. Appreciated, yes. But we don't know if those grants are intended for one newsroom, or will they be spread around? But wait, there's more. Google has come to realize that it is, in fact, in the news business, directly or indirectly. The Australians have been talking, negotiating, threatening Google since the first of this year, saying that it can't continue to rip off Aussie media. Google said in early October it would pay publishers more than a billion dollars over the next three years to license news content for a new product called the Google News Showcase. Quote, the product will display teasers for articles in the Google News section. Remember, this is on the Google sites, complete with images and summaries selected by the publishers. Users who click on the story panels, and here's the really important part, will be taken directly to news organizations' websites, where a story can be read in full. Hmm. A billion over three years, 330 million a year, 
I don't know how far that will stretch in the Australian media market or how it will be parceled out. I would guess the money will be distributed according to the number of clicks on a story. The reality of that is that the bigger, higher profile media will get more money. Fair, I suppose, but that might not result in an infusion of cash to the small, more local weeklies who are really on the thin edge. Still, it might be a start if media companies can develop and leverage the user click information to again pinpoint the demographics and desires of individuals. According to the Wall Street Journal, Google has already signed similar deals with nearly 200 publications, including Der Spiegel, Stern, Andelsblatt, and Folha de Sao Paulo. And there are more well-intended efforts at hand from Facebook, Microsoft, and some foundations. Sounds good, yes. But companies like Google rarely are motivated by totally altruistic reason. All of them, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, LinkedIn, might write some checks to local newsrooms. But they will also make sure that their products are prominently integrated into those newsrooms. There is still more to be done, I believe. One thing we can do is change the journalism profession. If journalism in the public interest is going to survive, its leaders must recognize that it will only do so if ongoing, continuous education is adopted as a major institutional objective. We need to start by recognizing that the data sphere is dynamic. The factors and tools of data in, analysis, information out are literally changing every single week. That means, I believe, that everyone in the newsroom needs to spend 20% of the work week engaged in research and exploration of the data sphere, experimentation with new tools and methods, and then sharing what they discovered with their colleagues. It would also help if budgets always included funds for everyone on the staff to attend at least one national conference every year, and not just journalism conferences. For me, the best annual meetings used to be the Special Libraries Association and the Esri User Conference. Esri is the Microsoft of the GIS world. Both meetings have attendees whose specialties range from anthropology to zoology. Such meetings are an intellectual treasure chest of new ideas, methods, and processes. Is such a shift of mission possible in times of financial stress? Only if funding sources demand that a portion of their fiscal support be devoted to that goal. It is also time for newsrooms to look outside of their particular publications. The idea of journalism competition, especially for the local and printed media, is a historical hangover. When I read the New Mexican every morning, only some of the stories, the local ones, are news. I already learned about most state, national, and international stories yesterday. Yeah, yeah, I'm a news junkie and a retired one at that, so I inhale much more news than the average person who must make time for a job and family. That said, there are important stories that could be best reported if journalists in states like New Mexico would get together in a more collaborative manner. Covering COVID-19 is a perfect example, but they should also be doing a better job of covering state government and the judicial systems. Next, newsrooms need to do more to integrate the various media platforms. Why, for example, aren't the New Mexican and KSFR, our public radio station, working together to build the richest information site for the city in northern New Mexico region? After all, it's not like they're competing for the same advertising dollars. Finally, and this might be getting too wonkish for this audience, it seems to be so even for most journalists, Print journalism can and must move beyond the old don't-tell show bromide. Why? Increasingly, the general public doesn't believe that journalists are telling the truth. One way to change that perception, I hope, is to do a better job of literally showing our primary sources to our readers. We're quoting someone? Give the readers access to our recorded interview, or at least the transcript of that interview or video. We make reference to some statistics or document. Make it easy for the readers to find that source and do their own analysis. And in our writing and subsequent printed editions, we need to implement 
tools to show and link. That is, make it as easy as possible for readers to connect to our primary sources that live online and in digital formats. Those can include broadcast and print sources, usually PDFs of government or government-related documents. So how do we do that? Here's a typical government news story from the New Mexico. City unveils plan. The second paragraph tells and sort of shows there is an action plan unveiled at a news conference. Okay, something tangible exists. It is likely that plan was handed out in print form. If so, the reporter can quickly scan it and turn it into a PDF that could be posted on the newspaper's website. Or, perhaps more likely, the city has already posted it on the city municipal website, making it accessible via URL. Now we're deeper into the story and learn about a scathing review of city finances. Wow, scathing! Man, that's something I want to read. So how can a newspaper or magazine make it easier for me to read that scathing document. How about the equivalent of a footnote or endnote? This requires a bit of work, but the reporter simply types a sequential number in the text. That number will link to a series of URLs at the bottom of the story, URLs that link to the actual document. Or, with a little more work, a QR code could be inserted for scanning with a smartphone. Yes, that will add work to the reporters and copy editors, but I would hope some publication would give this approach a 6 or a 12 month test to see if it improves reader faith in the veracity of reporters in a media institution. We can also make changes in journalism education. Lastly, there needs to be changes in the training of young journalists. Traditionally, student journalists were told to write so a sixth grader can understand it. That might be valuable pedagogy for someone in a first semester news writing class, but to maintain that objective will, fairly quickly I think, lead a reporter to look for the simplest and often binary solutions to telling a story. Call it brutal simplicity. To reduce the story to simply saying this is what happened or that was the result of the event too often overlooks the complexity of most and maybe all phenomena. Another way to put it is don't just report the event, report the trend and again the context. Journalism professors would do well to frame their department's entire curriculum with the data in analysis information out paradigm. Varying degrees of sophistication and complexity can be implemented in stages as a student moves through the strata toward graduation. Next, we need to show aspiring journalists that our skills and job objectives can include much more than what they probably see as the big marquee journalism institutions. Good work can and is being done not only on smaller news outlets, but trade journals, highly focused business-to-business -business publications, and technical writing opportunities abound. The stories and learning opportunities are ample, as are the salaries, which often exceed those of traditional media. Doing that will require educating student journalists on the new tools that are, could be, and will be playing a greater role in the profession. These are just some of the new methods already here for both news producers and our audiences. The learning curve for these is often steep and requires sustained learning and practice. At the very least, student journalists in their last two years of undergraduate training should be exposed to this smorgasbord of methodologies. This also suggests, I believe, that journalism programs need to stress more cross-discipline collaboration with other schools and departments in the university. So what are we seeing about the present and possible future of journalism in America? First, that everything in traditional journalism is declining, except for the greater than ever need for data, cultural data, governmental data, economic data, religious and educational data. The definition of data in all cases must be more broadly defined and seen as qualitative, quantitative, and geographic data. 
the stuff required to make informed decisions. Secondly, we must make broad and fundamental changes in how we financially support the valid, fact-based journalism necessary for a vibrant and successful participatory democracy. At the same time, we should make broad and fundamental changes in how we educate journalists, both in their earliest stages and forever in the newsrooms. And how about you? What can you do? Christmas is coming. We can literally invest in maintaining an informed democracy at the local level by buying and giving subscriptions to our local news media. If you're from Santa Fe, consider these news resources. Remember, too, that ads are also part of the data in category. Please let merchants know that you know about their products because of something you saw in the newspaper or heard on radio or TV. My friends, as old school journalists would say, that's a 30. The end of the story. I thank you for hanging in with me this afternoon. Senior Duncan, do we have anything on your end?